telling you what, it's already just a good Sunday. I walked to the back and I told him at the back, I said, man, I got to like have a recovery mode before I can go preach, man. That's some good stuff today. Holy Spirit is definitely here. And, and we are continuing in a series called It's About Time. You, you ever said that before? Like, it's about time, right? Your kids clean your room. It's about time. been telling you, like, your husband finally finished that project that you asked him to do two years ago. Hey, I, hey, hey. I bought my daughter a shelf for her bedroom, and I kept telling her, I'm going to do it. It took five minutes, but it really took four months. You know what I'm talking about? Four months, five minutes. It's about time. You ever ordered that package online for a birthday or Christmas, and then you're expecting it. It's on the day. It's got plenty of time, and then all of a sudden, you get that notice. It's not showing up. We found a package about two days later in the middle of the road. And we're like, what is that? It's our package. It didn't come in. Sitting in the middle of the road with the rain coming down. Well, at least it's about time it came in. You know, I mean, we're just grateful, grateful. I don't even remember what it was. Do you remember what it was? I don't even know what it was. It was so important at the moment. It's about time. But, but here's, here's the thought and the idea. When we wrap up life and we look at it, it really is about time. It's, it's, it's about the time that we have. And it's about what we do with the time constraints that we're in. We all are living within time. Seconds, minutes, days, months, years. We all are constrained by the same thing. Yet, every one of us have a different allotment, don't we? Some of us have more than others. Some of us, it's filled to here and some of it's, it's there. And so that's why time really does matter. Um, if, if, if you live like me, though, in, in a lot of your thoughts, it can feel like much of my life, though, is on some kind of hold or delay. Like, um, it can seem like much of the time that I spend every day or the things that I do, honestly, maybe these little things don't matter. I'm just like brushing my teeth or going to work. Like those things, like we can feel so often caught between moments that we think matter. The big, the big deals, the, the, the pinnacle moments, between moments, honestly, that, that we want to be in or don't want to be in. The, the first flight that I ever did, it was out, out of the country. I'd never been on a plane, and I'm going all the way to Europe, right? And so that's, that's adventurous. And so I was flying with this guy who you know, had a pilot that was a friend, and we're, we're right, flying something called standby. I didn't know what that meant. I know now. You know what it means? It means you stand by as everybody else is getting on the plane, and you're hoping to have a seat. So luckily, on the first leg of the flight, I mean, it was the greatest deal ever for us. I got to sit first class. Uh, it didn't always stay that way. You pretty much just get wherever you can have a seat. So there's this thing that I wasn't really familiar with, and some of you are, and I am now, called a layover. Well, whenever you have a layover and you're on standby, it's pretty much roll the dice, good luck. Because we sat there, and I had about seven hours of layover. Uh, seven, seven hours in a country I've never been, which is, one, not enough time to actually leave and go do anything, but two, not enough time to get any sleep because those chairs are awfully uncomfortable. So what do you do in the in-between time between the planes, between the moments, right? And I think a lot of us, we can feel kind of in a layover in a holding pattern sometimes in life, can't we? You're like, I'm just waiting for this or waiting for that, but right now, I just want to get out of trying to arrive somewhere that matters and get out of where I am. Ephesians chapter 5, we looked at this last week, but I want to look at the scripture again. It's kind of our theme verse. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It means there's a wise and unwise way to live, Right? Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Last week we looked at that word opportunity and defined what that meant in Greek and what have their view of time in this situation. Today I want to key in on that word every. Every opportunity. Every. Even the moments that we think that don't matter, maybe the scripture is telling us that they really do. Every, every opportunity. Every all the time, all, all, all day, every opportunity. Could it be true that all the moments matter? Could it be true that the moments that we think aren't a big deal, maybe the most pinnacle thing 
in our life. And I think what we do in the meantime between the two matters. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I love reading Ecclesiastes because it's from some guy named Solomon who's supposed to be the wisest guy in the world, but you're kind of just looking into the back back behind the scenes of his thoughts on life. And some of it can, like he starts off with like everything is meaningless. Like, oh gosh, this is going to be. But it's like he just pins down some of the thoughts that we all have and how to live within this life that we are. And Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, I just want to read this real quick. It says, for everything, 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 every, that word, right? Everything, there is a season. There's a time for it all. A time for every activity under heaven. Every, that that word just seems like it's a theme today, right? Verse 2, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, and a time to steal. Take the time to kill. Y'all hold your guns, okay? A time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance. Uh, A time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace, and a time to turn away. A time to search, and a time to quit searching. A time to keep... uh, a, A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to mend. A time to... Be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, a time to peace. You get the idea, right? Here's what this scripture is doing. It's telling these extremes. Like there's a time for all of these, the highs and the lows, but it's it's making an allusion to there's a time literally for everything, though. Everything has its time. And the time you're in has its place in your life. Here's what the scripture kind of looks like. If we can put that first graph up, that green, that green background. Okay, so here's kind of like, there's these big moments and then there's these small moments. And there's these big moments and small moments. But you know where life is usually lived at? Let's go to the next one. Right there. That's where we live life. Not usually in the extreme highs. Not usually in the extreme lows. But right there in the middle. You know what I mean? In the meantime. And if we're not careful, we're going to be caught up in the idea that life is about that place or that place, and we miss the majority of where life happens. That's where life is really at. Life in the meantime, in the between time, in the middle. And sometimes life can be messy, and sometimes life doesn't make sense. But these moments that sometimes we just want to get past, these moments matter. They matter. Think about our time. And, and like, I, I love uh, to, to read about people who have researched and broken down our time into years, and then it can be a little depressing to think about my life really has six months total of actual fun, and the rest of it is all this other stuff. I just give you a little bit of, I, I, said, I said this before in a sermon a while back, but I just, I just love the research on it. It said uh, 79 years as an average of life. It says 33 years are going to be in bed, which I'm all about that. A lot of cool activities can happen there. 13 years sleeping, watching television. What are these people? If you're watching online, I just apologize for them. If you're, if you're married, you can watch TV and all those things. It says 13 years working. 11 years in front of a screen, but the stat on that is actually changing. It says for the new generation, looking more like 15 years in front of a screen. Yeah. Just think about it. Let that sink in for a second. Now, all those moments, uh, which I don't know, you know how uh, they are for your life, but most of those moments are impressive, um, monumental moments. Right? Most of these are just like I'm going to work, putting on my shoes today. Like most of our life is caught up in that, those moments that we kind of want to look about, but... That's where the most of life is at. Everything else, we're left with a small sliver. So if we don't make this matter, is it true? Possibly the rest of it won't either. My, my thought is I kind of look at this stuff. I'm just saying, man, we can't waste it, right? We can't waste it. We can't waste it. We've got to do something with it. We've got to live in the meantime, not just waiting for something else to break, but saying this is the moment right here that I've got to do something. This is the moment when things change. Things aren't always where we'd like for them to be in life. But we've got to change the way that we see when we're in moments that we don't want to be in. We've got to reframe it to see this is not God deferring or delaying my purpose. Maybe this is just a season where God is developing the overall purpose that he has. Come on, this is development. 
This is, this is something that God is doing. Just think about some Bible characters. Let's go back and look. These are like all the people that we read their stories and can sometimes forget they're real people because they're in the Bible. But think about these people who just like changed everything and most of their life was lived in obscurity, not on the pages of Scripture. You're like, yeah, but they, yeah, but they also just like worked and they just waited for God and they just trusted God. Think about Abraham. God's like, Abraham, you're going to have bunch of children. The whole nations are going to follow after you. It's going to be, you're going to have a nation. Problem is he didn't have kids until he was a hundred. Is that on your waiting plan list? No, man. I can't diet for three days without some Doritos. <laughs> I'm being for real. 3D Doritos came back out. That was from my childhood. I bought a bag and went to town with the kids. I said, we got, this is just, this is only for nostalgia. Okay. And, and like, man, that was good. Joseph, had this dream he's going to do incredible things for God. But he spent 20 years from the dream going through places he didn't want to be, like prison and servanthood. 20 years until he was actually elevated where God had for him to go. Let's think about Moses. Moses, you're going to deliver all of my people and do incredible things. 40 years hanging out in the wilderness. Four days is what I give God. You know what I'm talking about? Four days, and I'm posting on Facebook how miserable my life is. 40 years, David, David was a kid who just honored God and he was serving his dad out and taking care of sheep. And, then, and this guy comes and he says, hey, you're going to be the next king. What? Awesome. 20 years goes by that he's taking care of sheep. I give up after two days. I, I'm, I'm the king. Y'all bow down to me. He just went and took care of sheep. Jesus. Okay. This guy, he was a, the son of God. God, the Son incarnate in flesh. Come on, paid for our sins. This, he's Jesus. You know what I'm talking about. But besides the Christmas story, and one little bitty story about Jesus as a kid in the temple, 33 years goes by. 33 years before his ministry begins. Most of their life has lived in the middle, in the meantime. And if they wouldn't have done something special with the meantime, there would have been no time for God to do the big monumental things because they wouldn't have been ready. They wouldn't have been prepared. Alfred Hitchcock said this, drama is just life with all the boring parts cut out. <laughs> right? There's just a lot of that. Just some parts that are like, oh, that's no fun. But, but it all matters. Maybe you don't feel encouraged yet. Hopefully we will before the end of this. <laughs> Most of the time, I think we're waiting on God to do something, and God's waiting on us to do something. God, something's got to break. Something's got to change. And God's like, I know. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do something. What if the key is really God wanted, waiting on us to live like right now matters? God uses obscurity. He uses difficulty. He uses the middle, the messy, and all of it to grow us and to develop us into what he's called us to be. It matters. God doesn't view time the way that we do. I, I said it last week. We talked about it. Our view and limitation of time is very linear, right? It, the clock is ticking. and Without realizing, it's a countdown, baby. And you don't know when it's going to be zero, but it's coming because we're all going to die. <laughs> Yay. Let's go home. Let's pray. <laughs> But God doesn't see time in the, in the way that we do. We see in minutes and seconds, but God looks through the lens of, of time differently. I don't think God categorizes things in time. I think he looks at life in purpose. Okay, I'll say that again because I don't think we picked up on what I was throwing down there. God doesn't look at life based off of time. He looks off life, life based off of purpose. Let me prove it. Um, Isaiah 46.10 says this, I make known the end from the beginning. Like God already knows the end from the beginning. He's got it all mapped out. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say, my purpose will stand. I will do what I please. Right? We're looking at God and saying, God, why me? Why this? Why? And God's like, because I'm building something over here. And unless we build a foundation here, I can't put up what I need to. So we got to go through this. Psalm 94, we read this chapter last week. It's the oldest psalm, only one written by Moses. And it said, for you, a thousand years are a passing day as brief as a few night hours. Second Peter, Peter writes this to his followers and he reiterates 
what, what Moses said, he said, this is important, guys, let's listen up. He says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years of the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. He's not slow. He's not delayed. He's not deferring what you think that he should be doing, as some people think. No, he's being patient for, I love it, your sake. He's not wanting anybody to be destroyed. He's not wanting anybody to perish. He's not wanting anybody to miss out. He's about wants everyone to repent. There's this movie. Um, it's a very theological movie, deep movie. It's called Click by Adam Sandler. Um, anybody ever watch that? He walks into a bed, bath, and beyond, um, which can feel a little spiritual. You know, stuff everywhere, and you feel a little overwhelmed. The arts closed down. I never bought anything. That's probably halfway my fault, but I liked walking in. Uh, there's a back room he walks into, and he's handed a magical remote control. This magical remote control, he's able to push pause and fast forward and all these kind of things in life. And he begins to use it to fast forward past the moments he doesn't want to be in. And then all of a sudden, the remote begins to understand what he wants and just fast forwards and fast forwards. And then he stops, and he's, look, and he's older, and now he's missed every part of his life. Because he fast forwarded through he thought didn't matter. I'm just saying this, don't miss what God wants to do in the meantime, looking for some other time. Ecclesiastes chapter, nine, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 through 13, going on that same chapter said, what do people get for all their hard work? I've seen the burden that God's placed on us all. Man, he's getting real, isn't he? said, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He's planted eternity in the human heart, meaning, man, we know there's something bigger, there's something broader, there's something more going on. There's eternity. But even so, people can't see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to end. That God has it worked out, but we can't see it, can we? So I concluded, here's his conclusion. There's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. What's he saying? Live where you're at. Come on, just enjoy life where you're at, no matter what it looks like. Seek God where you are today, in this moment, make the most right now in the everyday, in the difficult, in the average, in the highs, in the lows, every bit of it. Make, make the most. There's this lady named, named, named Tish Harrison. She says this. I love it. I love it. My good friend shared this, shared this quote with me, and it says, everyone wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. <laughs> Come on, that's good stuff. Everybody wants these major things, but we just don't want to go scrape the SpaghettiOs off that have been sitting there for two days. You know what I mean? I just wash that thing three times in the dishwasher and hope for the best. I'm just saying. But I got, I got just a few things I want to, as, as, as we apply this, I think it's time. I think it's time to, to change some things. I think it's time to look at our time, look at the meantime, look at that middle, those parts, and say, come on, this has got to matter. It's got to matter. So it's time. Here's the first thing. It's time to see God in it all. It's time. It's time to see God in it all. It's time to, to look and to realize that God is not just in some moments and not others, but God's in it all with you. God may be outside of the space-time continuum as we know it and see it, but he still walks with us in it every single moment. We've got to see God in it at all. And it's not in some Eastern religion way to where God is the chair and God, but God is with you. Every single moment, God is there. There's not a moment he's forgot about or is overlooked. Here's Psalm, Psalm 139, 5, I love this. It says, you go before me and you follow me. Like I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in a God sandwich. You know what I mean? Like he's the bread to my sandwich. He's all, he's in front of me. He's behind me. It's like, no matter where I go, he's surrounding me. God is with me. There's not a moment that God isn't there. It would change every moment that we lived in if we realized that. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it change people? Wouldn't it change how we talk to people? Wouldn't it change how we viewed people if we saw a physical Jesus beside us? No, no, no. You got him, tiger. I mean, he, and he's just like, we can see but to know and to realize and to actually look and to see God in every situation, it's going to change how we, how we live. Um, Christy, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I've got a mug at home and it says everything you do could be used in a sermon. Uh, and so she's lost a key to her car. And uh, we've looked everywhere. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, 
you go through the couches, and then tomorrow you go through them again, and then you look in the same places you've looked at. You look in everywhere, and we just think maybe it's been thrown away. We, we searched and searched and searched and searched for this key. Luckily, there's, a, there's an extra one still able still able to, to drive. And so we, I'm looking at buying a new key, but in order to program the new key, you got to have two other keys. And I'm like, how, stupid, how do you, why would you need, why would, why would you need another key if I got two keys? So I gotta, okay, I got to go to the dealer. If anybody can do that, let's talk. But lost, lost the key and we just can't find it. Searching, searching, searching. There's nowhere around. See, that's not the way that it works with God. Jeremiah 29 makes it very clear. God said, if you search for me, you're going to find me. What if we looked for God every day? Here's what happens. We see God in the huge moments. We seek God in the bad moments and forget him in most of the others. Come on, I'm, I'm preaching because I'm guilty. You're right. You just get busy and you go through. But what if we, could, what if we were actually searching out God? God says, because you're going to find me in every part. Colossians 3 actually says, it's not up here, but he says, hey, work is unto the Lord. Because even that job, even what you're doing, like, it matters. It's for God, not for them, not for my boss, not for them. It's, this is for God. He's with me. He's in it. And I'm glorifying God with what I put my hands to. Look for him. And we can ask the question, not God, where are you? But God, what are you doing in this? Here's the second thing. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time to find contentment. Contentment. Now, contentment, the idea of that, it's not really a word used every day, is it? It's so, we're so disconnected and removed from the idea of contentment anymore. Discontentment is a trap we find ourselves in whenever we begin to align our goals with that of what the world is doing and not what God is wanting. Again, guilty. Because now my goals and purposes are always for more, for bigger, for newest. And so I begin to undercommit to everything. I overspend on everything. And I'm left never content with what I have. And there's just, there's just key to contentment. Unless I'm content, can find contentment in whatever I'm in, I'll never be content no matter what I'm in. You think if I made $75,000, you'll be content. No, you won't. You'll max it out. You think if this would just break, I'll be, no, you won't. Paul, this is the guy who is like sitting in prison to give you some context, writes in Philippians, and I love this scripture. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He said, I'm not writing to y'all asking for anything. He said, but I've learned something. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. What? He's chained to somebody right now. He's in prison. It's a dude that used to have be wealthy before he gave his life to Christ, and now he's sitting in prison. I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it's like to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content. Oh, we should be on the edge of our seat right now. In any, in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, verse 13, what's his secret? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We, we, we pulled that one scripture out and we blasted it on walls, but we don't look at it in context. Realizing and looking to God in everything and knowing that through God, I can do all things. My God is with me. He's for me. It doesn't matter what it is. Like that's the key to contentment. When you step one, it's time to start searching for God. It's going to begin to lead to living a life of contentment. Contentment is something that's learned. If we're discontented in life, ask yourself the hard question, why? Because what am I really wanting? What am I seeking after? Why am I always needing more? What am I trying to fill? And why am I trying to fill a place that God wants to be in with something else? It's time. Here's the, here's the third one. These are just stacking, layering. They, it requires each one. It's time to be grateful. It's time to be grateful. Never, ever, 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 <gasps> ever underestimate the power of gratitude. Like, isn't that becoming such a lost art? The art of just saying thank you, being thankful. Oh, man, doesn't it, like, is this the East Texas thing? They say, oh, burn my hide, you know? I've been, I've been um, doing, doing some side business and some things. I've been talking to people from all over the country, and I say little statements like that, and I realize, oh, that's an East Texas thing, and this is a guy's from New York. He's thinking I'm an idiot right now. Then you just burn your hide, though, whenever you do something for somebody, and they're like, don't even say that, they just walk off. 
And like, thank you would be nice, right? There's one time that Jesus healed these lepers, the, multiple of them, and only one of them came back to say thank you, right? And there's a whole story about that. It must mean something. Thank, thanks, thanks, thanks. It changes how we think when we live with thanks. It does. It just does. It rewires our brain in the meantime when things even don't make sense. When you're living in pain, you're living between the moments. <sighs> Live grateful. Live grateful. Find things to be grateful for. Newsflash. Even if you're in the midst of something, you're not thankful that it's happening. There's grateful things and things to be thankful for all around us every single moment if we'll search it out. Even in the worst, we realize that sometimes it's really pretty good. Maybe not ideal. Our first response is being overwhelmed and to complain and self-pity and, and fall into depression. And like we all get into that, to that rap. But we got to let, let our first response be gratitude. I, it's hard. It's hard. Like when I, when I, when I, when I get a blowout or something, I'm not thinking, thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Thank you. What, what if we just said, thank you, God, that I didn't just get in a wreck and die? God, right now I'm aggravated and I'm angry, but God... Thank you that even this is happening in my life. Thank you that I'm healthy and that my family is healthy. Whatever, whatever it is, let, let our first response be gratitude and see what changes. First Thessalonians, again, not up here. I didn't get it in there in time, but it says be, be thankful in all circumstances. And it says this is God's will for you. It's God's will for you, right? Come on, big deal. God's will is for you to be thankful. There's a story of this church in North Carolina, they took a mission trip to a little island off of the, off of the Caribbean, Caribbean, whatever you want to say. We won't debate about it. Um, uh, off the Caribbean, and they went to this little place to do some ministry. It was a leper colony, and that's still a thing in, in some parts of the world. And uh, at the end of the week, after their ministry, they had a big service. And at the end of service, this, this lady at the back raised her hand really not to be mean, but raised her nub. It was, it was all of us had left her hand, and they looked at her in pr really a, a, a difficult sight. She had no lips, had no nose. Leprosy had, had taken it all, had, had no, no hand on one hand, just looked miserable and raised her hand and said, can we sing a song? And they said, what do you want to sing? She said, can we sing Count Your Many Blessings? <clears throat> Count Your Many Blessings. Lady who had nothing lived in sheer poverty, completely disfigured, and was excited just to count the blessings that God had given her. Come on, we can't, we can't count high enough. Jordan, can you come on? Here's what I want you to do. Would you, would you, you don't have to do it right now, but would you take time today to just write three things, three things you're grateful for. Then I challenge you this week, every day, would you write three things that you're grateful for? Hey, you don't have to do the social media post and, and put it on there, but just three things. Blank piece of paper. You look at it. Let's, let's, let's make sure we're grateful. It's time. It's time to get busy. It's time to stop waiting on something else and say, I'm going to be fruitful where I'm at. I'm going to do something, God. I'm going to, I'm going to thrive where I'm planted. This season, I don't want to be in God to be for real. I mean, there's some of those moments that we just don't want to be in, but God, where I'm at, I'm going to honor you. And I'm going to do the best that I can where I'm at. So we wait on God. We can't, we can't get a harvest without tilling some ground in the meantime, can we? We can't, we can't build a massive structure without forming the foundation in the meantime, can we? We can't, we can't dance at a recital without practicing in the meantime, can we? We can't laugh without praising in the meantime, can we? Come on, in the meantime, it matters. And you, you're like, I don't want to be where I'm at. Well, that's most of life, isn't it? Come on, life's not just Disney trips. It's brushing your teeth, going to work, and saying, God, I'm looking to you today. God, I'm going to find contentment where I'm at. God, I'm going to be grateful. And you're going to see joys beginning to come on the other side of this attitude change. It's time. It's time to change the way that we see the meantime. And here's the last thing as we end. And um, I want to take just a moment for this. This is one that I, I kind of adding in here. It wasn't on here. But 
It's time to praise. I feel like God just spoke to me this morning in the middle of worship and said, Praise is the gateway to breakthrough. Praise is the gateway for breakthrough. And it's heard it over and over and over in my mind. Praise is the gateway for breakthrough. So I think that it's time to quit waiting for some other season and say right now, God, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you, God. And sometimes we're praising and we're thanking God for the things that we see in front of us. And sometimes we're singing in faith for what we don't yet see. But praise is the gateway for breakthrough. And what if this meantime is not delayed, God delaying or deferring something good from your life? Or what if it's God developing something better than you could ever imagine? But we won't give him in the meantime would you stand up with me I want to take a moment and just wrap this service up with some praise because I think it's time that we praise we don't complain our way out of it we praise our way out of it we don't just think our way out of it right I, I love to think through promise but I'm praising my way out of it first So we praise. Come on, it's time, it's time, it's time. Sing with us.